when I came here to Phoenix, Arizona, I sold my Redwood Falls practice for one year's gross. And uh, that was the common denominator around the country. And so uh, he thought he could get a year's gross for his practice. And let me tell you that it's not happening that way anymore. So tonight we wanna focus on two different ends of the scope. Number one, for people that are just starting in practice and how do they build and how do they earn more, save more and live more. And then we wanna talk about the other end a little bit tonight and it's called the succession plan. And uh, Dr. C has uh, become an expert in the succession plan. And so he's gonna speak to some of that tonight. And uh, he's got a, a book that he wrote too that he will give to you free to tonight for just sticking through this, this 30 minute lecture. And uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. C and have him just give you a little bit of information about how do you start out? Because I had a, a student come up to me one day and say, how do you become rich? And he also said, to be pointed, he said, are you rich? And I had to think about that for a moment. And as you'll hear Dr. C tonight say, we can live affluently. Now, rich is in the person's mind. And to live affluently, you actually have to uh, not spend more money than you make. It's, it's pretty simple. And then for young doctors, we'll talk a little bit about it at the end, but it, there's a pattern and a plan that can make you uh, be affluent. And so here's what we're going to cover. Happiness defined. That's the reality exceeding your expectations. Uh, money can buy happiness, or I know for one thing, it can buy freedom. And then knowing and understanding your practice is real economic engine is mission to critical to your success. And then how to set achievable micro goals that fuel your desire to continue towards success. And then why traditional goal planning doesn't work and how to create a workable success plan for 2018. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. C and let him and let him start start and give you some of the insight that he's had uh, from, from going through the process. Through the process. Dr. C. Dr. C. Dr. Four, thank you for that introduction and, and thank you for this 50th year of Activator and all that you have brought to our profession and have been able to quantify uh, throughout the course of our profession. We're going to talk about a number of things today and it's going to be hopefully fairly fast paced and informative. There's no way we can cover a, the plethora of financial information in, in a 30 minute session. So hopefully we'll get our beaks wet a little bit, have some fun and still save some time for questions at the end. So if something pops up in your brain as we go through this information tonight, just take a few minutes, write it down. And then when we open up the chat box, we'll try and take as Dr. Four and I will try and take as many of those questions as we can. I want to take a little bit deeper dive into what's still on your screen today. Happiness defined is truly reality exceeding your expectations. Right now we hear a lot of students coming out of chiropractic school thinking they're gonna hang their shingle out and make $250,000 a year in their first year of practice. And unfortunately, uh, that's kind of a delusional expectation. And when that expectation isn't realized, all of a sudden we're now scrambling to try and find a level of fulfillment and happiness when our goals are not readily and easily achievable. So happiness truly, if we look at it from an analogy standpoint, I'm driving to work and my route to work every day very simply has 10 traffic lights. And if I normally hit seven of those red every day to work, that becomes my usual expectation. For whatever reason, tomorrow I hit five of those traffic lights green, I'm having a much better day because my the reality of my going to work has been exceeded uh, by a, a factor of two less top lights and gives me a few extra minutes. And my definition of happiness is a little bit more excited. Same thing if I hit eight or nine of those lights red or all of them, I can come into the office with a bit of a, an attitude and a bit of a, a, of a disgruntled opinion just simply because of the fact, well, all of a sudden now I'm, I'm, I'm in a different mindset and different state because my expectation was not met. And that's one of the things that as we go through this evening, why I wanted to start with happiness to define. 
understanding what your expectations are, setting realistic goals, setting realistic expectations is one of the very secrets to being able to accomplish those objectives that we set out for. Money can buy us happiness. It's an old, it, it's the old wives tale says money can't buy us happiness. We're going to talk about it a little bit more in the course of the body of this presentation that the true neuroscience is now saying something a little bit different. Knowing and understanding your practice's economic engine. What is your economic engine? Regardless of the style, type, success level of your practice, there's a true economic engine. One of the things that we get out of school with is a thing is a, is an un misunderstanding oftentimes that we graduate with the white coat syndrome and that we're doctors. Well, what we really are is small business owners, first and foremost. And one of the things that you have to understand about your business as a small business owner, first and foremost, every small business is truly a family business. Dr. Frank Savinsky is a founding partner in the Sidecar team, co-authored the book, The E-Myth Chiropractor with Michael Gerber. And that sentiment runs through there. If you're having a bad day at work, you're probably bringing that guy home with you or that gal home with you in your night and your family relationships are going to be a little bit more tense and stressed at home. So understanding that in your practice, your true economic engine is your ability to adjust patients. I got to give a, a, a little more of a acknowledgement to Dr. Ford because I'm always asked, what's that one thing that you did to create a very successful practice? For those of you that don't know me, I'm just turned 58, have uh, my very first grandchild who is now one month old, and I have three grown adult children. I've been married for 32 years and uh, to the same spouse, not to 32 years to, to 32 different women. So I'm very happily married, very fulfilled in my career. I started my practice in uh, 1985, and I exited six years ago next month when I was 52 years old. And I got to the point when I was in practice that I was developed a case of, of boredom. I'd always been a, a mentor and partner with Dr. Sminsky and doing some, some work with uh, mentoring doctors. I'm a, from a family of teachers. And my dad's a teacher. My mom was a teacher. My brother and sister and my other sister were all teachers. And there was one thing that uh, growing up that I knew I didn't want to be, and that was a teacher. And now today, 30-some uh, years later, I am a, a teacher. And I'm finding an incredible fun and fascination helping to transform doctors' practices to, to understand the business side of chiropractic and understanding the metrics and the things that we need to talk about to really help manage and lead a practice in today's kind of turbulent and unsettled times. So as we go through this process, understanding that your chiropractic adjustment is the real key. That's the reason I want to give the, the, the acknowledgement to Activator in the 50 years is that one thing that people always ask me, there is never one thing. It's a whole lot of little things done consistently with an effort to always be the best in the world that you can be at what you do. And the number one thing that I know I needed to have to, to be able to scale and serve the magnitude of people and make an impact in my community was confidence and competence in my adjusting skills. I met Dr. Four in 1981, 82 as a young kid. I was 22, 20 years, three years old when I was in chiropractic school. My second year, I started going to activator seminars not knowing a, a technique. Since my very first activator seminar in 1982, I have not adjusted anybody other than with an activator in my entire career. And that's saying something. So I'm very adamant about understanding that the key to success is technique mastery. You all as activator doctors have an unbelievable technical deliverable that's measurable, replicable, and successful, and you can see a lot of patient volume with this technique. It's absolutely essential to be a technique master. The second thing that I would put in my list behind my technique, because if I didn't have an instrument, I couldn't serve my patients. I was joking with one of my clients yesterday. I used to dream about if I had to get my arm amputated, that I'd have to call up Dr. Four and have him figure out how to put a prosthetic activator on my stump so I could still work. That's how nuts I was in my understanding of technique mastery and, and, and understanding the deliverable and, and be able to continue to practice. The next thing that is important to the success is your ability to manage the clock and the time. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time tonight, the time that we have allotted for this evening, talking a little bit more about the, the urgency of time, 
the time management and understanding the appointment book flow and understanding how to schedule and, and how the minutes really add up to create your success. Goal setting is, is absolutely critical. We're going to delve into that a little bit later as, all, as well. And one of the biggest problems you'll see as we talk about goal setting is there is one specific step missing in any goal setting plan, actually two. First one is I'll share with you right now, most people don't know where they're at when they're starting. They don't know where their beginning destination is. So if you don't know where you are, take it out of the context of setting practice goals or business goals or health goals. Put it into a destination, you're taking a trip. And for some reason, you're blindfolded and thrown in the trunk of a car and you're driven for three or four hours around your area and thrown out and told to find your way home. If you don't know where you're starting from, you don't know which way to head to get to your destination. So one of the very critical components is doing a statistical deeper dive into your practice to know what the numbers are, to know what the time of the patient visits are, to know all of these critical pieces to actually begin to help scale and develop the business. Dr. Arnold mentioned, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about affluence and, and being rich. There's a big difference. There's a very big difference. And I can tell you right now, uh, uh, with my 30 some years in the chiropractic profession, I've never met a rich chiropractor based on my definition of rich, but I've met very many affluent ones. I'm gonna share you with you a little story about one of my favorite basketball players of all time, probably one of the best players in the history of the NBA and college sports. Many of you know he didn't make his 10th grade cut in his high school and came back and worked diligently and effortlessly and effortlessly and tirelessly to become one of the best basketball players and most commonly recognized names. When Michael Jordan retired from the NBA, his retirement income, I get this guys, his retirement income from his endorsements was $40 million a year. Now, Dr. Arlen mentioned I'm kind of a little bit of a numbers guy. So as we break those numbers down, $40 million a year is $109,600,000 a day, whether he ever shoots a basket, goes to work, or does anything. So the reality is that you take it one step further. While he's sleeping his typical seven hours at a night, he earns $32,000 while he's in bed. If he goes to see a movie in those days when this study was done, he'll spend $10 for a movie ticket, but he'll make $9,200 while he's sitting there watching it. While his five minute egg cooks, he makes $380. While playing a round of golf, it may cost him over $200 for greens fees. He'll make $22,500 while he's playing. That's a definition of being rich, okay? Now, when we look at that money, we all go, yeah, that's rich. That's really rich. That's pretty hot. Now factor in this little piece of data. If Michael Jordan saves 100% of his $40 million of income per year, it will take him 500 years of savings and he will still has, have less money than Bill Gates did at the same time this study was performed. 500 years at 40 million, that's rich. So I'm gonna back up my presentation for a minute and talk about why very few chiropractors become rich. And the number one reason we struggle is our product is our time. The only product that we have in our office is our time. Whether we sell it during an adjustment, whether we sell it with a nutritional consult, whether we sell it in functional medicine, whether we sell it on a rehab therapy, whether we do sell it doing our notes, we only have a finite number of hours in a day. We do not get paid for sleeping like Michael Jordan did. We do not have factories making Nike tennis shoes uh, overseas 24 hours a day. We are the only economic engine of our practice. We also know by looking at literally hundreds and hundreds of practices that the prime economic driver of every aspect in the practice, whether it's a pure straight uh, chiropractic adjusting practice or one that has a, a multiple of vertical services involved with it, the primary 
driver of all the services is the chiropractic adjustment. If you don't think that's true and you do true and you do have a practice that offers some additional verticals or, or therapeutic procedures, if your chiropractic practice numbers are up, I'll promise you your acupuncture numbers up if, are up as well if that's one of your verticals. I promise you if your chiropractic visits are up, your massage business is up. If your chiropractic business is up, your rehab business is up. Your chiropractic practice historically and statistically will drive every one of the other aspects of your practice. And so what the challenge we have it really focuses around our ability to manage the clock and the appointment book. That's where the managing the numbers portion of this conversation comes in and is so important. When we are looking at the scalability of a practice. I was talking to a, a, a couple of colleagues testing some of my concepts tonight. Uh, and one of the doctors I was talking to used to have a, a 15 minute uh, treatment time with their patients. And in reality, that would allow that doctor to hypothetically see four patients per hour. And when you start breaking down the numbers and you putting putting a true hard clock on it, your practice numbers can really only support about 90% of your peak efficiency or capacity. It's very analogous to driving a car. And if you're driving a car too fast or under less than optimum conditions, you can only run that car engine up to the red line for so long before you start to have a breakdown. The same thing applies to your chiropractic practice. You can only push it so hard for so long before something breaks. So when we look at uh, that practice, 15 minute appointments between the doctor and the patient, that only allows for the maximum of four people an hour. 90% of four people an hour yields you the ability to handle typically three people an hour as you move through the process. As we start to lessen that time, if you take two minutes off of that 15 minute adjustment, gives you the ability to only adjust still four people because it didn't really make a big enough difference to the time restriction to free you up to create more capacity for your doctor patient interaction. If you drop that adjusting time or doctor time down to 10 minutes, now hypothetically you could see six people six people an hour, 90% of six people would be five. Drop that 10 minutes to five minutes, you could see 12 people. Now 90% of that would be 10. If you drop it to a five minute interaction with the patient or, or a three minute action, interaction with the patient, it gets really an interesting as you start to scale those numbers and how fast potentially at a three minute encounter that would yield you the ability to see 20 people an hour or 90% of that would be 18. Now, before we get all up in arms and I get a lot of mail about quality of care and these types of things, when I'm talking about the doctor's times, this is where we're going to focus on because there's a lot of things that still happen in a patient encounter. The terminology when we think about it, and if you, nobody has to comment or ask a question about it at this point in time, but I can remember years ago when I first started in practice, the term high volume practitioner kind of had a, a, a bad ring to it. And you'd be up and listen to a speaker talking about high volume doctors and all they're doing is running assembly lines and seeing people and yada, yada, yada. And I started finding myself falling into that mindset with these, these presenters and then it dawned on me that my practice was seeing a significantly higher volume but I was doing, I never marketed. I could never teach somebody how to do a spinal scare, spinal scare, that was clever, a spinal care class because I only did two of them. I never did a, uh, a health fair or a, health, uh, a mall screening or anything like that. My practice was 98% referral based from patients. And it was there because we were understood what the patient experience was. We were there because we understood and could take care of managing the clock and always be on schedule. And that is what creates the great patient centered exper experience. I will challenge you all today to, as you take anything away from this conversation, the 
field of practice, if, if we look back, those of you that have been in practice and in the profession a longer period of time, like I have 25, 30 years, the game has changed. The third party reimbursement, the insurance companies, the regulatory bodies have continued to move our cheese around the board. And as a mouse in the trap or in the maze, we continue to have to find it and look for it in a different way. If you look back on reflection, it seems like about every five to seven years, five to seven years, there's one of these fairly disruptive circumstances, ICD-10, uh, pre-authorizations, all of these things. And you look back to 25, 30 years ago, Dr. Arlen and I were talking, we still remember where we had a $50 copay in a 90-10 or an 80-20 policies for re reimbursement where we could actually send in a, a claim form or bill the patient and our average collections were always 99, 99.5% of what we charge because that's how it was always done. The, the game has changed. Now what happens is that because the game has changed, the cheese has been moved, we have to play the game and compete at a little different level. It is going to require a little bit more higher volume to create a degree of affluence in the lifestyle that you want as a, as a physician and an earner. Don't get your nose out of joint and feel discriminated. My son-in-law is an ER doctor. The amount of charting, he told me the other day, for every hour he sees patients in the emergency room, he's doing two hours of documentation, a one to two ratio. That's unconscionable in my mind that we are now so worried about creating documentation that we're taking high quality providers and making them truly technicians. Again, topic for another whole nother time. But what I want you to see here is this concept of higher volume shouldn't be scary, shouldn't be frightening. It's something that we're all by nature and design truly set out to be. What I mean by that is if we're going to the to run a 10K, I've never met anybody yet who says, you know what, this is my sixth 10K, and I'm going to go out in this race and see if I can run it a minute slower than I ran the last one. Everybody goes, I'm running my sixth 10K. I want to see if I can get a a PR, personal record. I want to see if I can go a little bit faster. I want to see if I can lift a little bit more on the bench press. The same thing is true in higher volume. I never set out to see 700 patients a week. I set out to see a few more than I saw last week. And over the course of days, months, weeks, and years of constantly working, committing myself and bettering myself and bettering my systems allowed me to scale to an incredible level, allowed me the opportunity to actually be such an important part of my community. One of the things I'm most proud of in my career is I was actually asked by three different patients' families to be a pallbearer in their deceased loved one's funeral. I can't imagine, I like my dentist. In fact, I was at my dentist this morning. I can't imagine my family calling my dentist up and asking him to be a pallbearer in my funeral, okay? Three times in my career. That's one of the most things I'm most proud of. The doctors that are a little bit more seasoned, I know Dr. Arlen, you, also probably have a very similar experience, but that's because you make more contact, you build bigger and deeper relationships and you constantly are creating a better experience. What we're talking about here is the wasting of your most precious resource is your time. We call it the one minute principle. If you manage your minutes every single day, the hours take care of themselves. One thing that I know of all the hundreds of practices that I've looked at, every single practice that's more than a year old is full doing things the way they're currently doing them. And I don't care if that's 30 patients a week, 30 patients a day, 300 patients a day, 400 patients a day, 500 patients or a week, or 500 patients a week. That practice is full doing things the way they're doing them. I was talking to a relatively new client that I've worked with the last couple of months. He's shocked at how his practice has grown and scaled just because he's looking at managing the minutes. It's amazing. Always start with that piece to create the capacity in your practice. Where are you wasting those minutes? One of the things that really 
got me thinking like this early on in my career was when I would go to the grocery store and in the grocery line, there'd be 36 checkout stations and there'd be three clerks checking people out and there'd be 12 to 15 people standing in line waiting to check out. It was the most frustrating experience in my life because it was wasting everybody's time. And that person was actually waiting to give you money to buy your groceries. And they're waiting in line because you didn't have enough staff to open up a few more checkout lines. So you'll find that as you dive into understanding where these minutes are being consumed, how you're expending your time capital will free you up to create a tremendous amount more capacity so that without sacrificing the quality of care of your office, you're able to add a, a, a ton of opportunity to serve more patients. We call it the dollar per minute. This is where we talked at the very beginning. You need to know where you are. One of the things that you need to know where you are is not how much money you make per hour, but truly understanding how much you produce per minute. If you take the doctor who's seeing a, a $45 average collection for their office visit and they spend 15 minutes with that person, they're making $3 per minute, $180 an hour. You take that doctor and now they're spending five minutes with that patient, they're producing $9 of revenue per minute times 60 is $540 per hour. That's pretty healthy. And unlike Michael Jordan, you can only do that in your peak clinical hours that you're working. So probably most doctors that we're exposed to are in that 24 to 30 clinical hours per week. So that's your peak. So you gotta know what your dollar per minute valuation is. It's a very easy exercise to com complete and you gotta know where your best value is. If you're spending as doctor time if you are truly spending time doing things that we would qualify as a dollar per hour job where you can hire a staff to help with your manage your EHR and, and docu do, follow you around and help you with your documentation, that creates a huge amount of capacity and releases a, a huge accountability burden on you and your practice having appropriate staff, have well-trained staff, have well-hired and recruited staff. I had a call today from an ACI that we'll, we've been working with. He said, I really got nothing to talk about, except I am so grateful for what's happening. I've never had a team like I have right now. They're bringing ideas to me, they're changing. And I said, the reality is, Dr. Tom, they're that way because your leadership skills over the last year have stepped up. Great teams, our teams carry our dream. And so we become very specialized in understanding that no one can deliver the adjustment better than you, the doctor. That's the one thing in the world that you do better than anything, anyone else. And when you understand that that's your most vital role, you can have someone else teach them an exercise. You can have someone else talk to them and get their supplements for them. You can have someone else help you with your nutrition and do this in such a way that your time is really dedicated only to serving the patients. Dr. Arnold talked about goal setting. This is a, I know we're going fast and furious here, but I want to be respectful of your time. Dr. Arnold promised you some time for questions and I want to make sure that we're honoring that. So we created a, a system called our SmartX goal system. I talked about early on in the conversation that if you don't know where you are, you'll never, and you don't care where you're going, you'll never be lost, okay? You gotta have a, a starting destination. So you gotta know what your current statistical metrics are. In Sidecar, we teach 26 different office management statistics that tell you uh, or give you enough data every week to manage your, your the, the, the numbers in your practice for help to forecast, help predict your valuations, help understand where your peak hours are in your in your practice, how you need to staff accordingly. But when we start setting the goals, a smart X goal, the acronym stands for a goal needs to be specific, it needs to be measurable, it needs uh, to be achievable, it needs to be realistic and it needs to be timely. Go through that again, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. If you're failing to set smart goals, I'm not a big advocate of the secret. I'm gonna write something down and it's gonna manif magically manifest. 
that, in my opinion, is a fallacy. The only way that you bring something from your vision, something that you are trying to improve, is the last part of this goal setting formula, the X. If you fail to create an execution strategy, what are you going to do to bring that future into the present? What action steps are you going to take? You will always fail to achieve your objective. It doesn't happen by happenstance. It happens by strategic thought and action. So SMART X is the acronym that you want to use when it comes to goal setting. In the book Wired for Wealth by the Klontz brothers, I skipped over it in the, in the slides, but the belief system, these are neuroscientist researchers. They're the Klontz brothers, K-L-O-N-T-Z. They're both neuroscientists. Uh, they actually did some very in-depth research on financing and the belief systems that wealthy people have. And one of the things that they found in their research was that in the U.S., if your family income, family of four annual income is under $50,000, additional income will actually create more happiness in that family unit. They found that above $50,000 in the U.S., there's literally no appreciable happiness value in your brain, in your life, and in your results. I know that's hard to believe some of you that may be making $50,000, but you have shelter, you have food, you have safety, you have security, your bottom uh, needs are being met and exceeded in the Maslow's hierarchy of social development. And so it really doesn't create additional happiness. Dr. Arlen alluded to the fact that as we go through and having a level of affluence, affluence means you have amazing relationships with your family, amazing relationships with your friends, amazing relationships with your community and your kids and your church and the people that you care about. But more importantly, you also have, or as importantly, not more importantly, as importantly, you also have the resources to enjoy opportunities that you can provide for your loved ones, your stakeholders in your community. And that's one of the absolute secrets. I'm going to charge you also with this bit of information from the E-Myth e Chiropractor as well, where you got to understand Michael Gerber has been the name, the E-Myth has been the uh, name, the best business book for the last 35, 40, 50 years. And one of the things that Michael says in that book is you as a business owner, small business owner, you have a moral obligation to make a profit. And that struck me very uncomfortably when I first read it, because I think a lot of times chiropractors have a little bit of a poverty complex. But as you dissect that statement, we have a moral obligation to make a, a, a profit. And that's because if we don't make a profit, our stakeholders suffer. Did you get a loan at the bank? Do you have student loans? Somebody took a risk on you. Your staff has a job. Your accountable to other people just than yourself. There's stakeholders in your community that are dependent upon you making a profit and paying off the, your debts and investing in your churches and your community activities, your staff. But if you don't make a profit and you go out of business, the most important people in this whole equation that suffer are your patients because you're never, no longer there to give them one of the only non-drug, non-surgical interventions and hope for health. You guys have an amazing gift in what you do. And I'm just get so excited and passionate about being able to go, how do I help? What little role can I help a practice go from 40 people a week to 80 people a week, 100 people a week to 150 people a week and make a bigger impact in, in your life and a bigger impact in your community? That's what this is really all about. Smart goals, execute on them, and it'll, it'll be magical as you move into the 2018 Year. This is the perfect time to start evaluating and seeing where you are currently and where you want to be. And then what executionable, measurable, quantifiable steps can you truly take to help you achieve the practice that you haven't maybe ever achieved up until this point? The reality is that history has often been said to be uh, a, an indicator of our predicting of the future or it 
the sentence is this history doesn't mandate the future, it predicts it. And what I like about that statement is that if you like the current trajectory that your practice is on, your finances are on, your ability to exit and retire someday, all of those things that you want to see happen and come into fruition. And if you're taking those incremental micro goals and making those things happen and you like the trajectory, the answer is simple. Keep doing what you've always been doing and you will continue to get more of what you have. If you're finding that things aren't quite as fulfilling in the practice, if you're not having as much fun, if the numbers aren't make, measuring up, if you're stressing over having to make payroll every month, all of those things, you're going to have to change something. You're going to have to start training. You're going to have to, to look at how do I get something resolved so we can actually have a bigger impact and a more financial level of affluence as we move forward. Very simply put, change your mind, change your habits, change your life. And we can start having a, a whole different level of affluence in experiences in our personal life. One of the things I'd like to do, and I don't know if Kevin, if you can help get gather the names. This is the book that I wrote seven. It, it's really short and simple and it's short and simple because that's me. Um, I'm not that complicated, nor am I that smart. When I was in school and graduated in December of 83, one of my teachers in my first year, Sec first year, second year, uh, pulled me into her office one day and said, you know, Doug, uh, they're going to put your grades on your diploma. And I went, what? That, no, no, they don't really do that. Well, in your case, they're going to make an exception. They're going to put your grades on your diploma, D, C. And that, I started laughing, okay, because I didn't really understand. I thought she was serious because my grades weren't that good in school. I was working through school, helping to pay my, my school. And as I said, my parents were all educators. They didn't pay my education. And this is a simple, but in order for something to work, to be scalable, to be replicable and sustainable, it has to be simple. I'm not going to say it's easy, but the system is very simple. It's very applicable. And if you do it consistently over time, you will be affluent beyond your dreams. So, uh, Dr. Four, are you available to answer some questions if we have some? Yeah, we're, we're, we're able. Doug, if you shut your microphone off, um, I wanted to add a couple of things to this. Um, I remember back when I was, <clears throat> actually, I remember it to the year I was 28 years old. And I went to a practice management seminar. You know, chiropractors have been doing practice management seminars forever. And uh, there were 50 people in the room. And uh, the doctor got up and finished up his first two hours of lecture. And then he said, how many of you in here would like to become a millionaire? And I remember raising my hand. And there were two other people that raised their hand. And he said, okay, the rest of you can leave and have a coffee break. And he kicked them out of the room. He pulled the three of us up front and he said, it looks like you're the only three that are really serious about this. And it was two other young guys. And uh, he said, I'm going to give you each a book, much like you're offering here tonight. And uh, the book was, some of you have heard this for many years, called The Richest Man in Babylon. And the essence of the whole book was, he said, if you save 10% of everything that you make from this 28 years old is what I was at the time. He said, you'll be a millionaire and it'll all be done by compound interest, not you. And I was just at lunch the other day with uh, a successful chiropractor. A successful making money, but not retaining money. He'd been off in three or four different screwy ventures in the last year. And uh, I asked him how they turned out. None of them had made, he's, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of write-off. And I thought, well, that's cool, but what did it do for your bottom line? Nothing. And so sometimes things are really simple. And I guess that's why I read the, Doug's book, and the seven, and it's, it's a very simple book and a good place to start. And I have a kind of a goal for this. I, I'd like to see what you all think about these webinars, and we'll maybe do them monthly. But I, I feel like there's not only technique, but I think there's there's some life lessons that I've learned in the 50 years that I've been in chiropractic over 50 now. And I am dedicating myself to two things, <clears throat> helping the young people get on solid financial ground. 
and then also the people that are ready to retire, showing them how. And uh, Doug is a principal in Sidecar, and some of you have never heard of Sidecar. Well, go look it up on the internet because it's a new way of teaching, and everything is done in small segments, and you can, you know, teach people how to answer a telephone. Uh, there's chiropractors are really good at taking care of patients, but they're terrible at management, and I include myself. All you have to do is ask my wife, and she'll say, you can't manage anything. And it's it's the truth. I, that's not where my head's at. But when we did the DISC test several years ago, that's a test that looks at uh, people's personalities, 68% of the chiropractors were social. That meant they loved people. Uh, there were about 5% that were directors. That meant they were finance guys and the C guys. They were the guys that were computing all the different numbers. And so chiropractors essentially are loving people that like to take care of patients and the rest of it, they really don't enjoy too much. So that's where I thought by having some people from Sidecar come in, uh, there's some people that I've talked to for several years about succession planning and some that I know here in just the last month that have started the process and they're thrilled they have because there's laws when you start selling things and there's things that you're not aware of and you need expertise and it's a very inexpensive lesson to have. And so it, it, let me give you an example. We have the National Institute of Chiropractic Research and we have a brand new paper in Madrid, Spain that is showing that activator is not only safe to treat osteoporosis, but it's also regenerating the trabeculum in the bone. Instead of giving the money to the government at the end of the year, like a lot of you had success in the stock market this year, give your money to NICR, go to your accountants and say, what if I give X amount to uh, the chiropractic world instead of to the government and do something for your profession, it's not gonna cost you much to do it. So these are the kind of lessons that I think we can learn in, in an hour at a crack. Uh, anybody got any questions out there? Uh, I see some things coming in that some people are putting their names in so they can get the book for free. Just uh, type in your name your address and your email number and we'll get a book off to you and so if anybody has any questions you can type them in right now i'm going to be respectful of time i said we would go from 45 to 50 minutes tonight and we're at 45. Uh, it says mark just wrote in says monthly webinars that assist our new graduates in business skills and mindset are a brilliant idea well that's what i'd like to do and it doesn't cost them anything. And so there, we're, what we're really doing is sharing uh, success and showing people, you know, what what they can do starting at a young age. It's much easier. And I happen to be a big proponent of Dave Ramsey, you know, the debt-free guy, and uh, some of his teaching. And uh, when you talk to Doug and some of the things that he's Proponing, purporting here tonight, we've got over a hundred people right before Christmas listening. So I know we got a, a topic that is that's good for everybody, and we'll get this out to our activator clubs and the schools and things like that, so they can uh, take advantage of this, and we'll bring some people in with different expertises. And so, uh, if you have any other questions, um, I see names coming in quickly here uh, with the uh, addresses and everything, so we can know where to send books. But if you have a question of Dr. C, uh, just please feel free to type it in and, and ask it. And we've got about five minutes left. And so we'll uh, be glad to answer anything that you might want to know. So just feel free, feel comfortable, and uh, we'll answer it. Okay, here's some things coming in. Uh, it says, uh, how do DCs retire? Well, <laughs> that's... That's a question. I'm going to cut my microphone off and go back to Dr. C and let him answer that. How do DCs retire? Um, that's a fairly loaded question, and I'm not sure exactly the intent of the, the, the question, so I'll answer it as broad as I can. Um, there's a, a lot of chiropractors who are so passionate. One of my, my mentors in South Dakota is a doctor by the name of Dr. Howell. Dr. Arlen, you know him. He used to fly from Custer, South Dakota in his own plane to activator seminars at, at 86 years old and maintained his proficiency rating throughout his, his entire lifetime. He just finally retired about six months ago at 90-some years old. 
my perspective of, of trying to create a, a higher level of affluence for our profession is to create options, to create a, a an ability or a platform that gives you the opportunity to continue to work for as long as you want to. My, my rule was always, uh, I, I will never run from something, but I want to leave and go to something. And in my personal situation, I had hit every one of my benchmarks in my practice, and it was time for me to do something else and move on to my next creative act. And I had the resources and the financial wherewithal to do it, so it wasn't putting my family at at risk. I had a, the ability to build up a, the proper exit strategy and what we call a successorship and mentor that through to the point where when it came time to sell my practice, uh, my involvement in the sale of the practice was having lunch with one, one of our patients who was a banker. She cried and she was happy for my doctor who was taking over uh, and was happy for me to move, be doing something else. I p- submitted three years of tax returns and the bank uh, granted him the entire amount of the financing because we had the relationship with the, with the practice and, and, and the bank. They kept their no- loan in-house. You didn't have to go secure secondary financing. I was able to cash out and, and be, be complete and whole without ever having to carry any paper because it was done correctly from the very beginning. So how do you retire? One other strategy is, is to not retire. And if you start looking at the business metrics and you look at uh, if you make $50,000 a year in your practice, that is like having over a million dollars saved, netting you a 5% after tax return. So if you get to the point where you can have job share, create this right stratagem where you can still work a few days a week and take home 50, 60, hundred thousand dollars a year, the, what that does to your retirement nest egg for what you need to feasibly have to retire comfortably uh, totally alters the playing field. There's so many different ways to, to do an exit. And my passion is to help our doctors l- discover ways to do it on their terms. They wanna practice and wheel them out of there on a gurney when they, they die. Hey, let's show you how to do that and let's show you how to make it fun and still be able to, 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 to enjoy it. You wanna try and get out earlier and do something else? There's a way to do that. It's a little bit more difficult. So I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, I got I got another question okay. uh, here. Um, uh, doctor asks, how long did it take you to get up to 20 patients per day by referrals? By referrals? You know what? That's a great question because I'm going to answer it in a couple of different ways. Uh, I, ma- I made this statement in, er, earlier on that, Every practice is full doing what they're currently doing. So one of the worst things when you talk to anybody who does professional marketing is to take and and spend a lot of dollars on external advertising and promotion when your internal systems are not up to speed and can't handle the experience. You're going to find that when you talk to me, I look at everything outside of our profession as my benchmarks, not inside of our profession. Because if something works for uh, Apple, it's going to probably work in our profession. If something works uh, for Nordstrom's, it's probably going to work in our profession. And what, because something from an advertising perspective works in our chiropractic world or perceived to it because it worked that one time, it doesn't mean it's going to scale across the platform. So when you talk to people, the worst thing they can do, they're going to open a new restaurant. You open a new restaurant, but you haven't proofed your systems, your food, your food prep. They always do a soft opening. So if they make mistakes, they're not tr- killing their business referral base forever. So the worst thing a practice can do is go out and spend a ton of money on advertising and marketing and not be able to support and create an amazing patient experience cycle. I know that's counterintuitive. I know the biggest complaint in chiropractic practice is how do I get more new patients? And I'm going to tell you the reality, the counterintuitive part is your practice is already full. So when you're starting from scratch, and, and you're a brand new practitioner and you're not up to that volume, the reality is you have to go out and be contactable. You have to meet new people. You have to do the appropriate things with your Google advertising, Google marketing. And the biggest factor is being able to get the best clinical results, but also create the best patient experience for that patient. 
you're going to see. St- Go ahead. Well, there, there's one other thing here that, uh, uh, Doug, if you shut your mic off, uh, there's one other thing here that I've, I've been through this five times. I've started five new practices. And here's what I learned. When I moved from Redwood Falls, Minnesota, where everybody knew me, to Phoenix, Arizona, where 60,000 cars a day drove by, they didn't give a damn who I was. It was a totally new practice, and it had to be started and built from scratch. And as Doug said, you have to be out there. You have to be handing out tracks and passing out. You have to have contact with people. And I don't care how you do it, whatever you like to do. I mean, if you like to ice skate, go ice skating and meet people at the ice skating rink. I don't care what you do. But here's the funny thing that happens. It takes four years, no matter how good you are, to build a solid base. It just It's just called a base roll. And so in the first year, one day you're driving a Ferrari because you had a bunch of new patients. The next day you're driving a Volkswagen because you haven't had anybody for a week. And they do get well. That's the objective. And that's where people make a mistake. Then they try to drag their patients out. And the, the peop- what I learned was, and I learned this by accident, we used to practice two nights a week. And by the way, this is another thing that irks me to death. In Phoenix, Arizona, I can't get an adjustment on a Friday because nobody practices here on Friday because they think everybody leaves for the weekend. Well, they do in the summer, but they don't the rest of the year. But anyway, we practice two nights a week and from seven till nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever, because I used to have a motto, there's never a day that we can not handle a new patient. We could see a whole ton of people. And here's what I learned. The less time I spent with them, the less adjusting that I did. And I'll talk about that some night alone, less is more. The more results I got and the more referrals I got. It's a funny phenomenon. In that old clinic, we had room for 17 cars in front and 40 cars in back. I remember pulling up there one night and everything was full. And I thought, oh, we're going to have a hot night. And we did. And at the end of the night, it was like we had fun. And then an older doctor said to me, that's called a herding instinct. People go where people go. And so that's what, and Doug can talk to you about cluster booking and all that kind of thing. And I had another question here. Uh, Where can I find more on metrics? Well, Uh, You can go to sidecar.com and you can look there and Doug can tell you and he can give you some ideas on metrics. It's it's not that hard, but there there are some step-by-step things that you have to do. And I know that we could go on here for two hours tonight, uh, but we're kind of getting at the end of our time. Uh, Let me look and see if there's any other question here that I see on here that I, I think we've covered the most of the ones that I have seen here that are uh, here's one uh, what is your current definition of high volume and what is a dollar visit average a doctor should aim for and I'm going to turn this back to you Doug I'm going to answer it the way I started to teach it I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to call it a high volume because let's use the the language you've learned tonight, higher volume. Higher volume is a little bit busier than you are today. You're going to always want to be searching for making yourself and your systems better so you can make a better impact in your patients. I think we have that ability. Dr. Arnold said he's never uh, turned a new patient away. In my practice, uh, I had what I called the terrible two syndrome. We can never be too busy, too inefficient, too ineffective, too overstaffed, too understaffed, too tired to anything to ever see one more patient. So at my maximum patient volume, we never had a waiting list practice because it was my job, my staff's job, our job to serve those patients and make sure that we took care of them to the best of their ability. We never turned anybody away. So that's the number one thing. And, and we were always able to respect our time and be so efficient that they, even if they didn't have an appointment, they were still in and, the, in and out of the office within a 10, 10 to 15 minute time frame, all inclusive of, of what we needed to do. So. Higher volume is, is, is what you're searching for, not necessarily a, a high volume. Dollar per visit average, I will give you last, um, uh, two, two weeks ago, Thursday, we had, uh, on our peer oriented training where we do our sidecar webinar, we had, uh, Cynthia English, who is the chief of the Palmer study, Gallup study. She actually came to us because she, her chiropractor was a sidecar client. And she had a great experience in that office from a patient experience cycle. And and it was just interesting to go through her. And she was talking about some of these metrics that the Gallup poll study 
d- discovered. And on a national level, according to the Gallup poll study, the average cash paying visit from a chiropractor cash only fee is $50 a visit in today's United States market, according to Gallup. The average with an ins- for an insurance visit out of pocket is $38. And then some reimbursement from the insurance company. What we're seeing in our internal metrics is the patient, because of high deductibles, high copays, is averaging right now between 70 and 80 percent of the total fee is being paid by the patient, in even with insurance. So I can talk, the, the 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 cheese is moving in all of these realms right now, and so. We're not talking about not doing insurance, doing insurance. That's a whole other conversation. But those are two really critical metrics that you can hang your hat on. Those aren't my metrics. Those are from Gallup, the Gallup poll study. Here's my, my last question up here tonight that I, I want to get out, you know, because I feel it's really, it's really important. Doug, would you shut your mic off, please? Um, it's from somebody that says, I feel like I'm go- getting nowhere. I have been open for about eight months and about 60 patients total. Now, there's some kind of a problem here. And if you've been open for eight months and you've only seen 60 people total, and I'm sure that's not new patients, I'm hoping it's it's not new patients, new patients because if it's 60 new patients in eight months, then that's a little bit different. But you're doing something wrong. And what I, I really suggest is you get a hold of somebody like Sidecar, go to their website, find out. They've got some inexpensive programs to get you started, and there's no one that can't be helped, but I feel I feel you know sad for you for trying that hard in eight months and not doing so well. Doug, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? And again, that's always the challenge in, in getting open-ended questions like this. Is it's, it's so frustrating without knowing exactly more information to be able to really diagnose some of the the problem areas but oftentimes it's not necessarily you know what we're saying but how we're saying it there's something there that that there's a disconnect between the doctor and patient it's that's not a statistical likelihood of what we see most practices that, that we see right now traditionally six to 12 months is the the window that we want to look at to meet what we define as minimum viability, where there's enough revenue coming in to meet the basic expenses of the office and maybe a little bit left over. You're not going to see a huge profitability in that first month. You, you can run 80, 90% overheads <clears throat> in your first year very easily. But reaching minimum viability where you're able to sustain, that's one of the frustrating things, <clears throat> excuse me, as business say, you know, the number one reason businesses go out of business in the startup phase is they're undercapitalized. And that's a, that's a bit of a half truth. When you really understand the, the, the metrics of it, the point of our minimum viability, if I have, let's say, start my practice and I've got, you know, $15,000 borrowed to get from zero to, to hero and, and hit minimum viability, but I run out and I, I can see it. <clears throat> It's going to be in the eighth month, but if I run out of money in the sixth month, I, I, I can't stay in business anymore. I can't pay the rent. I can't pay my bills. Whereas if I would have just had a little bit more money to infuse, I could have hit minimum viability, but I didn't. And if you go get more money, this is one of the emotional tragedies. I've probably seen this as well, but as you go back and refund a, a business that was undercapitalized, it takes a huge emotional hit on your heart and your soul to put more money and you got to, am I putting good money after bad? Is this not going to work out? And you start filling yourself with those seeds of self-doubt, self-deprecation, and you're wondering why, what's missing. Most of the time, it's not something that's truly missing in the clinician or in the doctor. It's something they're doing in how they're presenting themselves and communicating to their patients. Got to follow up on this and uh the doctor saying that was a total of 60 new patients in eight months. And, uh, you know, for a brand new practice, uh, uh, there's something that you're doing management wise, not as well. And because he says here, I have a total of 185 appointments in eight months. And so I believe that you just need some management help. And I think that can be Doug. He's average. He's averaging eight new patients a month, seven to eight new patients a month. His retention is 3.4, 3.5. Um, which means the average patient's only coming in for two or three visits. 
that's where the bottom's falling out. So yeah, I would agree with your diagnosis wholeheartedly. Okay, well, Doug, thank you very much for your input tonight and your talking to uh, Dr. Doug C, who is a principal in Sidecar. And uh, we'll be making the rounds again to have some people from Sidecar back in. Uh, if you have a topic that you'd like to have people discuss, some of us have been, as I say, you know, long in the tooth and been around for a while. Uh, why don't you just send it to me, aw4 at activator.com, and just tell me what you'd like to hear and what you'd like to have us talk about. And, uh, you know, we've been having about 300 people a night that are interested in this. And so uh, I believe that we, we've struck a few nerves here and we're going to try to look at the 800 pound gorilla in the room. So thank you for taking this time right before Christmas. And by the way, this is taped, so you can go back and go back. And Listen to it. Listen to it. And so, uh, thanks again, everybody, and have a merry Christmas from Activator.